Bye. This is Speaking Of. I'm one of your co-hosts, Alexandria Mack, and if you're just tuning in, for my past two chronicles, we've been talking a lot about rice. And it's not just because I tend to always be hungry during these roundtable discussions, my fellow co-host can attest, but because it's a crop that holds significance both economically and culturally. In my previous chronicle, we spoke to Blia Mua, who's a Hmong farmer in the Milwaukee area, about how tending to rice at a local Mekwan farm was reminiscent of her rice farming days back in her homeland of Laos. And today, we're going to dive into the history of wild rice in the native indigenous community in the upper Midwest region. But first, more trivia! Okay, Scotty Mariano, ready for the trivia moment of the day? You bet. True or false, you can pop wild rice just like popcorn. True. Yeah, true. Okay. You were both correct for the first time ever. <laughs> that was very simple. True. Even if it doesn't get as big and fluffy or puffy as popcorn, the dried and cured grains of wild rice become a crunchy and delicious snack when you add a little oil, heat, and a shake. One little fact off of that. I, the first time I had it, and I believe you can get it at a lot of these events, powwows will have popped rice often. So or at least I've had it more than one. And the first time I ever had it was at a powwow. So... For those who have not been, ask about it. Well, that's a good transition into today's segment. So like I mentioned earlier, today we'll be talking about wild rice. And I just wanted to point out that when I was originally pitching the idea of a few chronicles on rice farming, it was actually my co-host Mariano, who mentioned that you can't talk about the cultural significance of rice without bringing up the native community. So thanks for that, Mariano. Could you tell listeners a little bit about your own reporting that you've done on the subject in the Great Lakes region? So I've done a lot of reporting in Michigan uh, around native foodways and lifeways and how those relate to ecology, how they relate to just cultural and intergenerational continuity. And the last show that I did is in Giwe, it's called, and it's about a woman who's trying to regain her roots, but being an urban native woman. So like, how do you connect lifeways that are ancestral lifeways if you live in a paved road with Wi-Fi and electricity, you know? And the way she went about it was she started with food. And so we went to the Native Food Summit in Dewajiak, Michigan, and that gathered people from literally all over the U.S. And one of the workshops was on how to harvest and prepare and cook wild rice. And it was absolutely life-changing because I didn't really know much about rice. And I just assumed that it was kind of these patties where like people were, you know, what you see in movies in Pacific Asia a lot. And here it's, I think they collected it in canoes and, and it was literally growing into the water. So you would go to like lakes and rivers and look for it. And it was harvested that way. And it was also kind of planted. So it was fascinating to learn how people did it and that there were people in each community in Michigan that had specialized in rice harvesting. And that was kind of the thing they were known for, even if they had like other jobs. It was a really amazing experience. So much of the rice harvesting tradition is spiritual rather than just agricultural. And for Wisconsin's biggest native tribe, the Menominee, their name literally comes from the word Manumen, which is what they call the wild rice. It's a part of their identity and connection to this land. Our friends at PBS Wisconsin did an amazing job capturing oral histories of the Menominee tribe. So here's David Greeno, the tribe's cultural preservationist, sharing that history of their people and this crop. So, nature man the manelk, kakiki de mimos, stow my chase in a tour. In a now quiet, kakiki de mimos, yes, yes, you pay. My name is Dave Greeno. My nominee name is now quiet, which means when the sun is at mid sky or noon. I was given that name by one of our elders of the tribe about some years ago. But I'd like to speak about the Menominee people today and who we are and why we're here. Menominee is an Algonquin word. The full word is Omatnamanewak. It's people of the wild race. At the time of creation, the Creator gave us two special gifts so that we would always have them. Those two gifts were wild rice and maple sugar. And throughout the years after that, the Menominees were always in the midst of 
with the wild rice. And it would seem like we're, wherever we travel, the rice would, would be there. And if we left that area, the rice would follow us. So the neighboring tribes gave us that name, Menominee, people of the wild rice, which we still have today. And likewise, the Ojibwe have a strong ancestral tie to Menumen. Oral tradition says that the Anishinaabe people settled along the edges of Lake Superior after seeing visions of a food that grows on water. One of the things that's interesting about oral traditions is that we think of it as history has to be linear and it has to be authenticated by a particular credible source and all these things. And in oral traditions, you get whatever your teacher tells you. And they might have one aspect, and someone else's teacher might have a different aspect, and they're both true. And they're true in different ways. And, and it's not even about, like, spiritually, the way that you're told it's whatever you remember is what you were meant to receive. Mm. And that's the history that is for you. And that's what I was told when I was given some of the history that I learned as part of an oral tradition, and also some of the teachings that I learned in a sweat lodge and how that etiquette goes and everything. A lot of it was like, whatever you remember, that's what you're meant to remember. And so when we think of histories, the way we do it is like it has to be the winner's narrative and it has to be authenticated and verified. So hearing the Minnesota and Anishinaabe perspective on rice and the migration story of like, oh, well, you will find this food that grows in the water versus the stories that I was told, which were no, 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 like run away because there's people coming from the Atlantic Ocean who are going to get you like move inland. It's interesting because those are two different histories, and I don't think they're necessarily at odds with one another. It could be the combination of two parts of the same story. I just find that fascinating. In Wisconsin, peak harvest times are late August through September. And because this is a sacred food and an important aspect of Ojibwe culture, there are limits to who, how, and when people not in their respective tribe can harvest. For example, no machinery can be used, which includes motorized boats. The standard practice is a canoe being propelled along the water by two long sticks and a person collecting the rice by gently tapping the stalks with wooden rods. It's fascinating. If anyone's listening, try to go out and find a video and, and watch it. It is beautiful too that she described it as a heartbeat in order to harvest the rice and how life-affirming and perfect is that description. Incredible. It really is. Uh, it, it was amazing to see. It's beautiful. It's a wonderful way of thinking of harvesting, which is in harmony with nature's own rhythms, to keep that kind of analogy going. It's not disrupting the environment at all. It's not putting chemicals in it. It's not extracting resources out of it. It's just harvesting what's already there and then leaving it alone. And I think we should learn how to do things like that and be more sustainable in the way that we consume food. So Lexi, what is going on with wild rice today? So if listeners remember, Dr. Schlappi's research was pretty much preparing for growing rice with changing climate conditions such as droughts, right? And it's interesting and super relevant to this community right now because wild rice harvesters already are feeling the effects of climate change. During Wisconsin's gubernatorial debate back in October, wild rice was actually brought up as a topic that moderators mentioned when referencing climate change. Goes to Dan Hagen. Climate change is already affecting Wisconsinites. I have reported on Ojibwe people in northern Wisconsin and their reliance on wild rice. But more frequent extreme weather events tied to climate change are disrupting wild rice beds, threatening a source of food and culture for the Ojibwe. How should Wisconsin respond to a changing climate? Mr. Michaels, you have one minute. Yeah, thank you for that question. So, I was reading an article by Wisconsin Public Radio about this issue, and researchers estimated that close to half of the monument that was once in Wisconsin has been lost. The biggest causes? Higher humidity levels and shifting water depths. Higher water levels can uproot the young plants during the floating leaf stage, preventing growth. Half? I mean, that is a crazy number. That's alarming for sure <laughs> especially if this is something that you're relying on for survival yeah it's also it's alarming it's crazy half of it because we don't think as the the great lakes water basin shrinking i mean it seems like the lakes are just there forever but this is kind of terrifying if half of the native plants are now gone and they're all along the waterways which i, I feel like 
the Midwest does quite a good job at protecting, at least the, the Great Lakes surrounding areas. Um, that's, that's a big problem. And it's not just in Wisconsin that this is a concern. Our friends at PBS America Outdoors recently did a nice story in Minnesota on the growing limitations of wild rice. Baratunde Thurston, the host, spoke to Anishinaabe wild rice farmers Machal Abid and Veronica Skinaway about the threat and how the concern is about more than just food. With all the changes that happen in the world, there is this constant of the rice harvest. And you know, why does that constant, in the midst of so many other changes, why does that matter to you? It matters to me because this is something generational. This is something that's been here for hundreds and thousands of years. And this is something that you can't learn in a, in a classroom. This is something real special. Having some things taken away over time, it makes us appreciate even more. Yeah. You know, it makes us fight harder for it. One of the things that's interesting also is the economics behind it. I think trying to get wild rice, assuming you can find it, because it's not easy to find, is going to cost you like four or five times what you would get, even like really, you know, sushi grade rice. It's super expensive, but it reflects the labor that goes into it. Whereas a lot of the ways that we get rice, sure, the labor is in there, but those folks aren't getting paid for their labor. And so it's not exploitative in the way that our current way of getting rice is. And I think that's another economic benefit of wild rice consumption is that the folks that are giving it to you because it's so scarce are actually charging you for their labor. We mentioned earlier that for those interested in manumen harvesting, that they have to follow clear rules as to not disrupt the traditional practices at play. And just seeing the manual practice, while it's obviously hard work, we can see the calming element of it. Almost like a meditation, once you find the rhythm along the waters, becoming one with the tapping of the sticks and pushing through the water. It reminded me of a conversation with Blia Mua in my previous Chronicle, where she described how despite modern technologies being available, she still prefers planting and harvesting by hand, simply because that's how her people have always done it. And that translates to other cultures too. The idea of taking the time to grow your food with your hands, slowing down and appreciating how practices thousands of years ago still sustain us today. Well, gentlemen, this wraps up my third and final Chronica. And this is the end of our mini season. We've taken listeners all over our beloved city from Enderis Park to the South Side, River West to Mequon and even West Dallas. And now that we're back at our home base of Milwaukee PBS, what are some takeaways and favorite moments from this little experiment? Favorite moments? I really appreciated getting to know River West in a different light because I had briefly thought we might buy there, but we weren't able to buy there. I'm also curious, uh, during the two years that my kids were homeschooled because of the pandemic, they went all over like you know there's a riverside park and river edge park it's called and then the schlitz audubon and stuff but I'm, I'm wondering if now i should take them to visit ricing areas or some native land where rice harvesting is happening i mean it's done now but maybe next year so i don't know Th those are the two things that i was thinking like during your episode sexy i was thinking how can i get my kids out to see ricing happening here in wisconsin and then also it made me want to go in and explore River West with my kids and have them look for Arby's. <laughs> <laughs> um, what a pleasure it was to be able to go to a drag show for work <laughs> and to drink some beer and to eat some fried pickles and watch Marbella perform. And, you know, anytime you're doing that on the clock, it's a, it's a good it's a good time. It was fascinating to get a deeper, richer understanding of this place we called home, whether it's the Los Primeros, the first Latinos to come to Milwaukee, whether it was a deeper understanding of a place where I live in River West and some of these unsung heroes that we don't talk much about that I discovered, or just having a better appreciation and knowledge for indigenous cultures and tribes here in Wisconsin. It's, I don't know, it just... For me, it only, what's the word I'm looking for? For me, it just 
I don't know. I just, it's why I love this place. It's why I like living here. It's love why I love sharing stories here. And so thank you both for the stories that you brought. I hope our listeners enjoyed it too. I've enjoyed this mini season to really explore things that I did not get a chance to explore in our first season. And now I'm motivated going into our second season of like, okay, what are those stories out there that are still, you know, untapped that would be a good excuse to find out about? I'll just say that like one of the things that I really like about the format of Cronicas is this idea of learning to love a place better with its people, its history, and its culture. And I feel like this season has done that for me as the one in our triad here that is not from Milwaukee and who knows the least about Milwaukee. It's helped me see the city a little bit more closely, more intimately and to appreciate it more. And that's not to say that I didn't have an appreciation before, but I literally set foot on Milwaukee soil for the first time when I was offered the job. So this has been a new experience for me and exploring this with you guys has been very rewarding and it's really made me appreciate the city we call home. Yeah, I remember when we did our video trailer for the teaser for the season and we talked about how, like, when we did stories about the neighborhood in Milwaukee, like, we wanted to stay away from beer and cheese and, like, Cream City Brick. And, like, we love those things and we adore those things, but, like, those stories have been told, it's out there, and we really kind of wanted to explore maybe some underappreciated themes in our stories, and I think we definitely accomplished that. This is Speaking Of, a podcast by Milwaukee PBS. We'll see you in 2023. I'm Alexandria Mack. I'm Scotty Lee Myers. And I'm Mariano Avila. Thanks for listening.